Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India discuss about two different other modes of corrosion that is one is high temperature oxidation another one is liquid metal corrosion. So, so far we are discussing about the aqueous corrosion problem and high temperature de oxidation or dry corrosion is a little bit different from that aqueous corrosion because in this kind of corrosion there is no aqueous uh, media in the environment. So, if you quickly go through the uh, definition of high temperature oxidation or dry corrosion, it is nothing but it basically occurs in absence of the aqueous media. So, it is a corrosion where which involve the reaction between the metal and that of atmospheric oxygen or any other species at elevated temperature. So, usually if you just quickly go through the microstructure of the oxidized surface, you will find that there is formation of oxide scale on the surface and uh, that oxidation is basically diffusion controlled process and as a result of which you will find that you through the action of there is formation of very thin oxide layer or initiation of the oxidation process or uh, is very fast, but as soon as the oxide layer forms then subsequent oxidation kinetics will depend on the nature of the oxide film that is forming on the surface. If the oxide film is highly protective in nature then you will find that kinetics of the oxidation is will be slower, but if it is not protective it if it contains lot of defects on the surface or inside the material then you will find that the rate of oxidation will be higher with time. So, initial initiation of oxidation if you think of you will find that initiation of the oxidation depends on the free energy of formation of oxide of different alloy system and which is actually uh, which is actually documented in the form of in the in the Ellingham, Ellingham diagram where you will find that free energy change associated with the oxide formation is plotted as a function of temperature and different different environments. So, in Ellingham diagram you will find different Ellingham diagram in different environments, but that Ellingham diagram basically is very important because it acts as a guideline for the choosing of choice of the material for a specific environment with temperature. So, this is a kind of uh, guideline for the cho choice of material uh, as a function of choice of uh, material or materials combinations in different environment. So, basically this particular, but you have to be careful because though Ellingham diagram gives uh, information about the initiation probability, but as soon as the oxide layer initiates or initial oxide layer forms the full surface is covered by the process of like uh, initially there is adsorption then nucleation and growth and then film coverage. So, after that is covered then naturally the subsequent oxidation kinetics will depend on the, the nature of the oxide film which forms on the surface. So, particularly for alloy system you have to be careful. In alloy system there are different species in the alloy. So, you will find that there is a formation rate which is different for different species. So, depending on the, the that probability of formation of oxide that highly probable probable oxide film which forms on the surface will form on the surface and then gradually whether it will continue or not depends on the which elements which oxides are there on the surface and subsequently its nature particularly the kind of defects are there in the oxide scale whether it is uh, highly um, protective or not the kind of stress that stress that is generated after the oxide scale formation. So, those all factors play important role in determining the uh, further kinetics of the oxidation or overall kinetics of the oxidation after the field formation. So, now if you quickly go through the uh, typical uh, parameters which influence the oxidation kinetics at a later stage. So, initiation is basically controlled by the probability of formation of oxide, but if you take about if you think about propagation first problem which faces is that 
that uh, oxide layer is having differential thermal expansion coefficient as compared to that of pure metal. So, because of the differential coefficient of thermal expansion between the metal and that of oxide scale, you will find that there is lot of stress generated at the interface. So, there is a parameter which basically is very important and which again is a kind of guideline to know the overall protectiveness of the oxide film which is forms which is formed on the surface that is peeling bed earth ratio. So, peeling bed earth ratio is nothing, but it is a ratio of the volume of the oxide scale to the volume of the metal. So, this particular volume ratio is very important because it ultimately controls the overall stress level that is uh, generated at the surface or particularly at the interface because of the oxide formation. So, ideally if filling bed earth ratio is 1 then the oxide scale is highly protective, highly protective, but if it is much lower than 1 naturally you will find that surface is not fully covered and if it is much higher than 2 there is there is lot of stress generation in the interface. So, it is not really good it cannot offer the protectiveness on the surface and if it is much lower than that of 1 and a little bit lower than that of 1 or equal to 1 or if it is lower than uh, much lower than that of 2 or little bit or near to 2 then the oxide scale is supposed to be protective in nature. So, it is very important to know the prelink bed earth ratio of the different component of the oxides uh, which different components uh, of the uh, different components which are forming oxide in an alloy system for choosing the alloy for a specific environment. So, if you quickly go through the the peeling bed earth ratio of uh, different uh, elements, you will find that they vary to a large extent. Like in alumina, the peeling bed earth ratio is 1.28, so it is highly protective in nature. In calcium, it is 0.64, so it is non protective in nature. In cadmium, it is 1.42, it is again protective. So, in cobalt, it is 2.4, so it is non protective in nature. So, chromium, it is uh, 2.04. So, it is uh, non protective, but uh, it is also near to 2 bosho, it is really protective in nature. Iron it is 1.78, it is protective. Magnesium, manganese, these are non protective because this is much lower than or much higher than the 2. Molybdenum, it is non protective. Nickel, it is uh, protective. So, lead, it is protective. So, you can understand that depending on the element which are forming, it is uh, the protectiveness of the uh, film actually varies. So, you have to be careful in choosing the element for developing the alloy. So, that the film which is uh, formed on the surface because of the uh, oxidation of the individual ingredient or individual element they are highly protective in nature. Now, this is the kinetics of the oxygen. So, you find that uh, you as I mentioned you. So, initially when there is a full coverage of the surface with the oxide, usually the oxidation process basically proceeds by the counter ionic diffusion. So, there may be diffusion of metallic ion through the oxide scale at the surface and then reaction of the uh, oxide reaction at the surface and then formation of the oxide film or otherwise it may be like oxygen is uh, migrating through the oxide layer deep inside the metal. So, at the interface between the oxide layer and the metal there is oxide formation. So, when the this particular thing happens like when the oxygen ingresses inside through the oxide scale come to the metal surface and there is formation of oxide scale. So, in that case the oxidation proceeds in the along the inward direction. On the other hand if the metal ion waves basically he ingress in metal ion just uh, diffuses through the oxide film come at the interface between the oxide and particular interface between the oxide and the environment, then at the surface of the oxide there is oxidation process. So, that is basically by outward movement of the metallic ion. So, inward movement of the oxygen or outward movement of the metallic ion are responsible for the uh, kinetics of the oxidation at a later stage. So, if you just quickly go through the different kinetics that follow uh, when you see the oxidation process you will you will find that there are basically three categories one is uh, linear behavior then th that is another one is parabolic behavior and third one is cubic behavior. At the initial stage of oxidation when that uh, 
of a compound it starts oxidizing very thin layer of oxide forms and at that particular layer that uh, at that particular stage the oxide scale is basically non continuous porous and cracked in nature. So, you will find that rate of oxidation is very fast. So, you will get typical linear behavior, but as soon as the surface is covered with the oxide and that oxide is very thick and also non porous and also uh, in, in, that is basically non porous and defect free in nature defect free in nature then there is parabolic behavior which is observed. So, where the mechanism of scale growth is very slow and you will find the kinetics of the scale growth is very slow and is basically it is a kind of parabolic uh, shows the parabolic behavior. So, here in this case the diffusion of the element or counter ionic diffusion is responsible for the film growth actually. So, but rate of film growth is quite slow the way the film will grow depending on the relative diffusivity of the individual element through the scale. If the diffusivity of the battle ion through the scale is faster than that of diffusivity of the oxygen ion through the oxide scale, you will find that the scale is forming at the surface. On the other hand, if the diffusivity of the oxide is oxygen ion is much higher than that of diffusivity of the metal ion, you will find that film is forming at the interface between the oxide and that of metal. So, the wave film will form in case of the parabolic uh, in case of the oxide uh, oxidation which shows parabolic behavior that depends on the counter ionic diffusivity of the element relative diffusivities of the element which is participating in the reaction. So, in case of uh, uh, in the in that case where the temperature is very high a k cubic behavior is developed for non porous adherent and uh, the thick oxide scale protective oxide scale. Hmm. So, where it is basically in cubic behavior you will find that this is basically the, it, it further reduces to a large extent with time. So, different behaviors are observed basically and depending on the uh, kinetics and also depending on the nature of the film depending on the temperature depending on the oxygen ion concentration or oxidation oxygen partial pressure. So, kinetics of oxidation follow different behavior in different uh, stages. So, if you are interested to increase the oxidation or decrease the oxidation tendency of the material, you have to choose the proper alloying element so that and or so that that alloying element forms the oxide which is highly protective in nature. You have to think of proper uh, surface alloying that is the one of the remedy for improving the oxidation resistance of the alloy system. You can also get rid of typical oxidation problem by typical uh, using it in a temperature which is safer temperature you cannot should not expose that temperature at which there is a very rapid rate of oxidation. So, if you think of the application of the uh, surface engineering in mitigation of the high temperature oxidation you will find that for oxidation for that oxidation uh, mechanism in many cases that alloy is responsible. So, you have to think of surface alloying it with proper alloying element particularly silicon chromium and aluminum these are three alloying elements which offer very good oxidation resistance property. So, you have to alloy it by any of the existing alloying system like diffusion based surface alloying or maybe laser surface alloying treatment. So, that surface is full of that material that alloy which offers good oxidation resistance property and by that process you can basically minimize the kinetics of oxidation or maybe probability of the oxidation phenomena. So, next type of uh, corrosion is liquid metal corrosion as I mentioned you that liquid metal corrosion is a typical kind of corrosion which is called also dissolution. So, also embrittlement because when the component solid metal is in contact with the liquid metal it gets uh, brittle in nature which is uh, nothing but degradation where certain metals lose its uh, tensile ductility or undergoes fracture when exposed to specific liquid metal. So, this is called like liquid metal embrittlement phenomena. So, if you see the surface of the embrittled uh, component you will find that there are a lot of surfaces full of uh, roughness because uh, there is a lot of material removal and on, on that of uh, that is the loss of dissolution lot of dissolution is also there in the right side 
or in the left side if you see you will find that there are a lot of uh, micro cracks formation and also the grain boundaries are uh, basically enriched with the liquid material. So, this is the case for the steel 3316 stainless steel 316 stainless steel exposed to liquid sodium at 700 degrees Celsius for 8000 degrees. So, you can understand that this liquid measured metal corrosion because stainless steel is very much used as a can for carrying the uh, liquid sodium. So, after 8000 hours of exposure this kind of problem may happen and if you see the surface of the stainless steel you will find that it got roughened and leached away and also red uh, embrittled to a large extent and there is also loss of uh, ductility. So, you have to replace it time and again so that this problem is no more there or so that new materials come into the carrying purpose. So, you do not have any problem of the overall loss of the component. This is the case for corrosion of incoronal alloy 706 exposed to liquid sodium for again 8000 hour at 700 degree Celsius. Then you will in a late lake circle hot lake circulating system. So, porous sulfur layer has formed this porous sulfur layer has formed. So, you will find that this is basically the cross section if you see carefully you will find that the porosity content is so high that many cases it is interconnected in nature. So, this component will fail very I mean at a much faster rate when it is subjected to tensile stress. So, this is corrosion of nickel in static lithium environment after exposure for 300 hours uh, at 700 degrees Celsius. So, you can here also you can say that porosities are basically interconnected in nature and that on the surface it looks like big big holes. So, if you quickly go through the tensile ductility, uh, tensile strength of that uh, particular uh, liquid metal uh, embrittled uh, liquid metal embrittled component you will find that tensile ductility is reduced to a large extent by the process of the uh, liquid metal embrittlement. So, this is the case for uh, effect of this is the graph which shows the effect of environment on the yield stress and strain hardening rate of various iron aluminum alloys tested in air and mercury indium solution. So, in air if you see you will find that uh, the tensile ductility is much higher, elongation is much higher if you go on increasing that uh, and on the other hand in silver indium solution it is a little higher lower. As you go on increasing the aluminum content you will find that here uh, in, in aluminum, aluminum content in one case it is basically iron another case in iron aluminum alloy. So, if you go on increasing the aluminum content there is formation of iron aluminum that is basically much the naturally that particular alloy is much brittle. So, you will find that it is having lower stress and also lower yield strength and also lower UTS and also lower percentage elongation. So, as you go on adding using the silver indium solution uh, that there mercury indium solution there you will find that there is further decrease in ductility and as you go on having a steel with uh, 17 percent aluminum which is itself which itself is highly brittle in nature there you will find that there is further decrease in the ductility to such a large extent that it fails very quickly. So, depending on the alloy system the behavior actually changes and you will find that it gets embittled to a large extent. Sometimes small amount of uh, alloying elements such as lead and tellurium when it added to steel it improved the machinability, but leads to the embrittlement phenomena. Hmm. So, cadmium plated titanium and steel are embrittled due to high temperature service by molten cadmium. So, you can say that different adverb, small small amount of the uh, ingredients can cause severe trouble by the liquid metal embrittlement problem. Similarly, indium used as high vacuum seal in steel chamber cause cracking due to breakout operations. Zircaloy tubes used in nuclear reactor have been cracked by both solid and liquid cadmium. So, different again like stress corrosion cracking liquid metal embrittlement, embrittlement process is also very much environment spe specific. All material does not undergo liquid metal embrittlement in an all environment. So, similarly you can say the mechanism also more or less same as the name implies this is basically liquid metal embrittlement. So, what happens is that naturally here stress has to be there either internal stress or external stress 
because everything phenomena is usually observed when it is subjected to stress. Otherwise, if it is in static condition, there is no stress is applied, there is no problem. So, whenever you are applying stress and when there is liquid metal in the environment, it basically there are different ways by which the crack initiates and propagates. So, first way or first mechanism of the crack initiation and propagation is dissolution and diffusion. So, whenever the crack tip is subjected to liquid metal or liquid metal faces the crack tip, you will find that it basically it dissolves the stressed part and because of the dissolution and subsequent diffusion you will find that the region gets the interatomic bond strength in that region decreases as a result of which you will find that crack propagation occurs at a much faster rate. So, this is one mechanism another mechanism is that adsorption of the liquid metal and adsorption of the liquid metal at the crack tip and nucleation of uh, dislocation and then pile up work hardening this all phenomena observed. So, here in this case where there is no liquid metal uh, on the other hand here it is with for liquid metal assisted degradation. So, in that case where there is no liquid metal so the typical phenomena or mechanism of the stress uh, mechanism of the typical uh, frac fracture generation is uh, uh, nucleation and growth of that uh, uh, dislocations, but in case of here also same mechanism occurs, but here you will find that plastic zone width is much lower. So, small small plastic zone formation is there. So, naturally you can understand that there is uh, interatomic bond weakening and then dimples are quite shallow in nature and crack propagates at a much shallower uh, rate and also in a by formation of very shallow nipple region and then finally, it fails. So, whatever happens in case of normal metal which does not undergo stress corrosion crack liquid metal embrittlement if you just think of the same alloy in liquid metal you will find that the typical mechanism may remain same, but overall ductility because of overall decrease in ductility you will see that it gets partially embrittled and by that process there is the crack initiation and propagation. So, you will find that uh, there are different uh, reactions which occur one is direct uh, dissolution in case of lower activity key element like uh, nickel for reduced nickel for lithium lead or sodium system. Then corrosion layer formation like uh, low activity reacting element reduced chromium and nitrogen in lithium system. So, elemental transfer there may be elemental transfer transfer increase or add, add element to decrease the transfer tendency which, which usually occurs in case of uh, steel by increasing chromium content. Then alloying phenomena like avoid system that form stable compound that is uh, here do not expose nickel to molten environment. Then compound reduction is element elim, eliminate for solids that can be reduced by liquid metal. So, here actually by you have to take care of this problem by avoiding bulk solid lithium couple. So, you can understand that this problem actually the problem of liquid metal embrittlement occurs when there is improper or maybe mismatch in the liquid metal to solid combinations. This mismatch can be avoided by choosing proper materials for that particular liquid metal environment. So, like zinc if you just use gallium marker indium and lead 20 percent zinc it will undergo that stress, uh, liquid metal embrittlement. Aluminium gallium marker ma cadmium and mercury it undergoes liquid metal embrittlement. Copper mercury antimony then cadmium and lead, lead thallium these all in undergo and intermittently that liquid metal embrittlement. Steel in presence of aluminium antimony bismuth cadmium galbium again it undergoes the liquid metal embrittlement. So, you have to choose proper environment or for carry where there is chance of the liquid metal exposure you choose proper metal proper alloy. So, that it does not undergo the liquid metal embrittlement problem. Now, if you quickly go through the if you quickly summarize the different modes of corrosion and find out the surface parameters which are responsible for that. Uh, kinetics of in controlling the kinetics of different types of corrosion this chart shows the perfect uh, guideline for that. For example, now till date we have discussed about 
three types of corrosion one is aqueous corrosion second was high temperature oxidation third one is the liquid metal corrosion now in aqueous corrosion again different modes are there eight different modes like uh, general corrosion galvanic corrosion pt corrosion crevice corrosion selective bleaching erosion corrosion stress corrosion cracking and hydrogen embrittlement and if you just quickly go through the that surface parameters which are responsible or which basically controls the corrosion kinetics they are surface roughness microstructure composition and phases hardness toughness and residual stress so now if you think of the uh, effect of the these all parameters which partially influence the general corrosion rate so you can say that that surface roughness surface microstructure composition and phases these three parameters are very important and also residual stress so these four parameters are very important which control the uh, general corrosion behavior of the component if you see the galvanic corrosion behavior again surface compos material comp composition is very important roughness is important microstructure is important they are again residual stress value is important if you talk about pitting corrosion again surface roughness microstructure composition and residual stress are important previous corrosion also the same thing in selective bleaching also composition and phases they are very important surface roughness is important to some extent uh, but not not to a large extent if you talk about erosion corrosion they are basically surface roughness surface composition and phases and your uh, hardness also very much important stress corrosion cracking if you talk about they are uh, basically surface roughness is having very uh, to some extent it is having the influence because it basically controls the initiation rate so the surface roughness then composition and phases hardness huh? those all things play and also toughness play important role hydrogen embrittlement again toughness plays a very important role toughness composition phases microstructure and surface roughness if you talk about hydrogen embrittlement uh, if you talk about high temperature oxidation here two important factors are responsible to cause the high temperature oxidation re related damage one is residual stress second one is uh, typical composition and phases which are present in the microstructure so these are roughness also to some extent and in liquid metal embrittlement phenomena composition and phases are very important so you can understand that which are the parameters that basically influence the different corrosion behavior of the component so if you just go on controlling the, those parameters you can easily reduce the or minimize the tendency of the corrosion attack by different ways so in summary it may be stated that in the last six uh, talks we discussed about different types of corrosion and its importance we also saw different classifications like broadly it may be classified into three types one is aqueous corrosion second one is high temperature oxidation and third one is liquid metal corrosion and aqueous corrosion may further be classified into eight categories depending on the mode by which it is uh, proceeding and uh, we also discussed about mechanism of corrosion in different modes characteristics of each form of corrosion it is very important that you know the characteristics of different forms of corrosion if you do not know the characteristics of different form of corrosion it is very difficult to understand in which mode failure has occurred and hence stop it at by taking appropriate measure so finally we also discussed about ways to combat them in brief extreme brief way but not really in details so in the next uh, few classes we discuss about the prevention technique by the corrosion prevention of corrosion different techniques which may be applied for prevention of the corrosion thank you very much